Our next guest has some very interesting things to say about a lot of things, but one of them is a controversial thing called Black English. Now, Black English is a manner of speech used by uneducated Negroes, both in the urban ghettos and in the rural farms. Uh, one example of that would be uh, the elimination or the distortion of the verb to be. For instance, Mr. Smith, he dead, or I hungry, or I be tired. Now, the subject of black English is only one of several tricky problems examined in a truly wonderful little book, and it's called The Irrelevant English Teacher. Now, there's some fighting words in this book, and the author will be on our stage right after we make out a few deposit slips. Now, let's meet the author of The Irrelevant English Teacher. Number one. What is your name, please? My name is J. Mitchell Morse. Number two. My name is J. Mitchell Morse. Number three. My name is J. Mitchell Morse. And here is the story of J. Mitchell Morse. He says, I, J. Mitchell Morse, am a professor of English at a major university. It's my contention that one who cannot express himself clearly cannot think clearly. In recent years, an increasing number of black students maintain that using standard English as the only language of instruction is just another white trick to keep them down. They demand that black English be recognized as an effective medium for intellectual work. I say that this is nonsense. Why? Because black English lacks the precision and clarity that are necessary for even moderately complex thought. There is absolutely no contradiction between helping students become articulate and working for social change at the same time. Signed, J. Mitchell Morse. <laughs> and we'll start with that most relevant of men, Mr. Jack Castle. Yes, thank you, Gary. Um, number three. Uh, what university are you a professor at, please? I'm in Maryland. Number two? Co College Park, Maryland. University of Maryland. I see. Uh, what's the percentage of black students? I'm afraid we, I can't give you a correct figure, but approximately 28%. Number two, do you agree with that? I am at a different university. Oh, may I have your university? Temple in Philadelphia. Aha. Uh -huh. Number one, do you, uh, are you at Temple also? No, I'm at another university. I'm at MIT, and our percentage there is 11% black. Ah, thank you. Number two, what is the percentage of black in your, in your university? I would say it's about 5%. Uh-huh. Uh, recently, there was an IQ given, and forgive me for not knowing the title of the book, but number three, uh, about the fact that the same IQ tests were given to black students as white, and when they changed the questionnaires, to commonly called black jargon or black English, as you say, the students fared much better, the black students. Do you, do, are you aware of the IQ test? I think it was rather regional. Must have been very regional in its conception. Uh-huh. Number <laughs> Thank you. And from Jack, we go to Kitty. Well, that is a good question, Jack. I'd like to pursue that with number one. Do you know about these tests that were given? I know about them, but I'm afraid that I don't really agree with the IQ test itself. The, the whole thing doesn't work very well. Snow doesn't mean the same in the South and the North and so on. It's, it's really... Uh, number two, what exactly does the title of your book mean, The Irrelevant Teacher? It's a response to the popular belief that the liberal arts are irrelevant, and I say that's fine. Oh, they should be irrelevant. Oh, do you agree with that, number three? Yes, I do, too. Well, what should one teach? Only science? What about the humanities? Now, uh, well, they all have their place, but I believe uh, schools are on their way out as such, and from uh, college uh, down to parts of high school. Do you, but number one, do you believe in non-traditional studies, too? Yes, I do, but uh. of course, let me say quickly that we have to know some things, that, and we have to write some things very clearly Thank at you. MIT. Uh, number two, when you say that nobody who can think, who speaks clearly, can't think clearly, you mean speech impediments then don't count, like stuttering or that sort of thing? That is a minor problem, if it's a problem at all, but we think in words. 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. We're going to go down to G. It's a fascinating question. Number three, where did you, uh, how old were you when you learned to speak English? Well, actually, I was born in England. I came here, and I'm an American by choice. I started at the University of Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, I got my BS there and stayed right on. Thank you. Uh, number two, uh, uh, number one, I beg your pardon. What, what led you to the contention that one who cannot express himself clearly can't think clearly? What light bulb lit over your head when it, you first got that idea? It lit for me uh, when I was in the Navy in World War II, and I was doing some struggling to do some teaching. I'd never been a teacher in those days. And I was trying to teach people from different backgrounds simple things about running a radar scope and how to adjust things. And they couldn't think clearly unless they could speak and Number understand two, these words. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Were you in the Navy during World War II also? No, I wasn't. What but did you? I mean, were. <coughs> hup, hup. Hey, boy, there are a lot of unasked questions around her pig. Number three, did you say you had a BS? Yes. And a master's? I got my master's too. And do you have a doctorate? Yes, I what do. What did you do your dissertation on? Li uh, liter literary criticism. Thank you. Number uh, two, uh, what book did Strunk write? He wrote the original version of the Strunk and White um, Thank you. Elements of Style. Yeah. Elements of Style. Thank you. Yes, now, number one, is English a changing language? Every day. Thank you. Well, now, since we have incorporated English so much French and even so much German, why couldn't we easily incorporate th those black words and, 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 and make it all? I mean, it should be viable, shouldn't it? it English, why can't we accept everything? Well, our, the purpose of an English teacher, uh, obviously, is not to accept everything. It's merely to see how to express yourself clearly, try to teach people to express yourself so that people can understand what you're trying yes, to say. Yes, but number one, in the name of more vivid, uh, uh, if you don't want to have a dead language, some of those words that they introduce are very <laughs> vivid and seem to me to be very helpful to English. Don't you agree with that? No, I do not. Uh, I think vivid, vivid writing is, um, is very nice in freshman English. We get a lot of it. But oh, it, I'm talking it, about it, vivid it? talking. I'm very big at vivid talking. <laughs> 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 and there goes the vivid ding-dong, which means no more questions. It's time for us to mark our ballots. They have to do that. You and I will make up our minds visually. Do we think it's number one or number two or number three? And uh, Jack, have you? yes, you've completed your ballot. If you'll show it to us and tell us why. Yes. Well, I... I voted for number, uh, number one gave some splendid answers. My, my choice is number two. Uh, number one seems uh, terribly determined and, and feels strongly about it. Uh, number three, um, I, well, I voted for number two because, uh, mostly because I didn't find out too much from him. And um, okay. he looks like uh, a writer. He's Real quiet. Sake, folks. Looks like could be. <laughs> All right, we got a two show in there, and Kitty. Well, number three said he did his dissertation on literary criticism, and if he doesn't believe in the humanities, I think he's wasted a lot of time. I voted for number two because he said, you think in words, and I subscribe to that. We got a pair of twos, Gene Rayburn. Well, Gary, I agree with number one that language is a living, changing thing, but I really believe he looks too young to have been a lieutenant in the Navy during World War II, so I voted for uh, number two. Well, all right, we got a thing shaping up here, Peg. Well, number three, I don't think you can do a dissertation on that sort of looser title, but number two knew about Strunk and White on Style, which is a book if you teach English, it's gotta be right there all the time, so I voted for two. Oh, boy. The real man would not approve of this expression, but our panel is letting it all hang out. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a bunch of twos. The votes are in with the real J. Mitchell Morris. Please stand up. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. <laughs> Gentlemen, sorry it worked out that way. I thought you were splendid. Number one, what's your real name and what do you do? My name is Earl Eames, and I'm a management consultant specializing in organization development and motivation, living in Plandome, New York. Ah. <laughs> and number three, sir, would you uh, remove your mustache and tell us who you are? My name is Heino Orth Pallavicini. I'm associated with the David West Agency of the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company right here in New York. And, uh,
You're right. I would have and known. without his mustache, he has also been an imposter how many times on our show in the Five past? Five times. This oh. is his fifth time on the show I as an imposter. Anyway. <laughs> uh, 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 may I ask Professor Morris, are there any colleges where black English is a study? You put your name Black on? studies, yes. Black English, no. Black English, no. Thank you, Professor Morris. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us here on Tell the Truth. <laughs> In addition to the cash awards, our first team of challengers will lose. This is Bob Williams speaking for To Tell the Truth, a Mark Stepson, Bill Todman production.